Welcome back to another episode of Dropping Gems. Um, we have a lot of school of journalism in the building today, so you know it's going to be a good show. Uh, Ola Mazuka from Indoor Recess. I'm the OG Ben Rayner. Thank you for joining us. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Uh, I'm, I'm going to give a little bio for the people who are unaware of the prolific work these people have done. We're going to start with Ola. Um, the, the, other than being one of one of my favorite people to work with, um, you know, she started at the age of 15 as a journalist, writing about heavy metal and extreme subgenres from around the world, leading her to contribute to publications like Exclaim, Hellbound, Large Up, and Noisy. Um, you know, for three years, she actually invested in her work as a project coordinator at McMichael Canadian Art Collection. And then merging a passion for art and advocacy, she is currently active in her role as publicist at Toronto-based management and PR agency Indoor Recess, working with a multitude of artists from Canada and around the world. We'll talk about Ben uh, really quickly here. Now, uh, I, I like your your bio probably some of the best out of all the bios that uh, we got because there's a little, little self-deprecating in there, which, of course, I'm a huge fan. Um, we'll get along. <laughs> Yeah, he dreamed of being a music critic and was just a weirdo misfit teenager, mainlining formative records by Joy Division, PJ Harvey, and the Jesus and Mary Chain at the late night broadcast of CBC's radio, Brave New Waves, and City TV's The New Music in rural New Brunswick. Big shout out to New Brunswick. Despite an almost complete lack of experience, he bluffed his way, more or less, directly from studenthood into that exact same dream job at the Ottawa Sun via Good Fortune in late 1996. By 98, as an opinionated, opinionated young sprout, fortunate enough to have planted his feet in Canada's burgeoning indie rock rave scenes, at just the right time, he managed to claw his way up to an even dreamier position as resident pop music critic for the Toronto Star and subsequently held that title at Canada's largest daily newspaper for nearly 22 years before it was eliminated. In 2020, he contributed to such publications as Exhalator, Fashion and Spin along the way and has long served for juries the Players Music Prize, the Prison Prize, and the So Can Songwriting Prize. Again, welcome, guys, to Dropping Gems. Nice Thank to you. Be here. Um, we're gonna we're gonna start way back in the day in high school. Um, I feel like that's a time where a lot of people are kind of deciding what they want to do, you know, and starting to kind of make moves towards um, that career they're looking forward to. When you guys were in high school, and I'll start with you, Ben. Did you? What was your idea of what you really, really could do or thought you were going to do? And, you know, how did going to school change that or cement that for you? Well, I, I, I mean, I was kind of lucky. Like, I, I really decided pretty early on that I wanted to be a music writer. Like, I was obsessed with stuff like Rolling Stone and Spin. I read tons of music journals. And my dad always had music, uh, like, music magazines around. It just seemed like a cool thing to do. My mom was a my mom was a reporter. My dad is a music teacher, retired music teacher. So it's like basically biological oh. determinism was was working. I mean, this they actually met as reporters uh, at the Cambridge wow. Evening News. But I uh, yeah, I, I, I kind of went to school thinking I might be able to do it eventually. Uh, I went from school uh, to your rival school, Carleton University, from ninety two to ninety six, and uh, would say it to professors and stuff and it was kind of like yeah yeah that's right but I actually wound up with you know a fairly encouraging arts prof who, who told me yeah you know what there's not that many it's not that many gigs like that and not that many people who are good enough to get them so talented people tend to get hired it was like it was encouraging but like all through high school all through university I was like oh, I'll probably have to put in my my pay my dues you know for 10 or 15 years and mm -hmm. Uh, and work my way up to it or talk my way into it. But I did an internship at the Ottawa Sun and by the end of the summer, I talked my way into to taking over for the music writer because this was at Ottawa in the 90s and Alanis Morissette was around. So he, he was leaving to write a book about <laughs> Alanis Morissette. So I actually turned down my first full-time offer of a job wow. to take a three-month contract as the Ottawa Sun's music critic. But I was like, literally like their summer student and then I had it and it's, and I, I've had it, I had it until you know, last last December, like I I I still don't quite know how that happened, but I wow. yeah. So I didn't. I thought I'd have to work. You know, like lucky things do happen to people, like who don't deserve it. That's the way I look at it. Well, what about yourself? Um. Yeah. Uh. Good question. High school. Um. High school is where it all began for me. Really. Um. I, I started out many years ago thinking I was going to be, become music, uh, a marine biologist, 
uh, until I failed science and math several times in high school. And, uh, it, it, you know, simultaneously, I was a musician. I played string instruments and woodwind instruments for, for many years as well. So I was uh, not in a band or anything, but played in bands and jazz band and competed in, you know, Ontario Band Association competitions throughout uh, elementary school all the way to the end of high school. So I was a musician for for a long time um, and music's been my life forever essentially. Um, I grew up with uh, a plethora of styles at home um, and was immersed in it all the time and it's really all that I thought about 24-7 you know all the time every day and it, 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 it is something that I've come to know as a vocation of mine. I, I, I've channeled it as a vocation and something that I really dedicated myself and my life to no matter which way that evolves or turns. Um, but long story short, originally I was like, you know, I want to be a musicologist. I want to, you know, author scholarly journals and be a talking head in documentaries. And I, you know, I want to write books and teach courses. And I'm like, oh, yeah, I'm not, I don't love school too, too much. You know, it's too much schooling. And mm -hmm. a friend of mine, because I, I did excel in writing, a friend of mine was like, well, you know, I had mentioned it in passing, you know, I think you'd be a good journalist. Uh, and so as someone that invests myself in an interest like wholeheartedly, I am someone who's very deep into research and understanding a topic. If there's something that I, I love or I'm interested in, I will like dive into it and be absorbed for days and months. And uh, one of those things uh, was heavy metal music and extreme subgenres of heavy metal. And I got into that uh, at a young age, evolving from, you know, getting into grunge and hard rock and alternative and things like that. And, as a, if, you're from, if you're from the metal community, you'll understand that when you listen to heavy music, you just want heavier and heavier. And some people, it might stop at a certain point. But for me, it's like, no, death metal and Swedish melodic death metal and mm. Norwegian black metal to like uh, thrash metal from the Bay Area and all these things. So that was my life. Um, and uh, to express that love for it, I wanted to write about it. I wanted to find a medium to share that love and passion with other people. In the age of MySpace, uh, I found a, a webzine called The Metal Pits that was based out of St. Mary's, Ontario, kind of near Grimsby. And um, I just cold call, reached out to the editor and said, hey, you know, I, I'm in grade 10. I'd love to start writing for you. Uh, if you want to send me like, you know, any, any uh, sample promo copies or anything or streams, like I'm happy to, to review these albums for you for free. And that's how I got started. And in that time, I even, I interviewed Angela Gossow from Arch Enemy, which yes. many people who understand, you know, death metal would, it's a pretty big deal. Uh, and then it just flowed from there. So I actually started, I was a published writer um, at 15 in high school. Um, and from there, it just kind of flowed on uh, into doing a lot of, a lot of different work. And then from there, just expanded my portfolio and pitched to other publications was one of the founding, you know, one of the, starting uh, staff writers at Hellbound and then Exclaim and then got into uh, writing about the diasporas and that's like my that was my other beat for many years as well writing about um, diaspora and arts and culture within within several of them in the world and uh, that that's kind of how it started and I knew from then on that's what I wanted to do. So I had no idea Ola you and I had metal and J school in common I think we should be friends. Yes <laughs> definitely. <laughs> That's what we do here on Dropping Gems. We're trying to make some friends here. Yeah. I, I wanted to. Well, we appreciate. Uh, it. I wanted to thank you for that shout out to MySpace. I can't. I can't remember the last time um, yeah. MySpace was mentioned. So big shout out to MySpace. Ben, you talked about this a little bit. So I want to get your your answer, Ola. Was there a person um, when you were in high school, you know, starting to get your feet wet, who you who you saw that was doing what you were doing, who was maybe a little older than you or maybe more established in the industry? you see someone that you kind of say okay if I can kind of follow their path maybe I'll be okay well I mean I was I was, I was in rural New Brunswick and it was I mean kind of like the only the only kid in school um into the stuff I was into really except I had my friend Heather who lives on the street yeah I was a few years older I would lend me like cool records and stuff but like it was so I like I was looking outside I loved reading people like uh, Chuck Eddy and, and like the, the, the sort of the golden age of like spin and stuff. Uh, um, the girl, was it a kind of my, 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 but you know, I didn't really, just like, I just liked voraciously reading and following. It was actually like, 
for me, a, lo a lot of the a lot of the people leading the way were like the CBC's Brave New Ways that I mentioned in my bio, which was like a cool late night radio show devoted to uh, alternative music, but kind of like right at the crucial time, like just before grunge and everything broke. Down. And Brent Bambury hosted it at, at the time. And, and, and it was like, also the, the new music was great for them. Because, because I didn't have any access to it. We had no cool radio stations. We didn't have a CFMI. We didn't have campus radio. So I kind of had, like, I, I basically had the dream invent, <laughs> like, invent this path for myself. Mm -hmm. And it was, it was actually like a lot of the broadcast people, like Denise Donlan and, uh, and uh, who else is on there? One on, uh, Daniel Richter, all the like journalists who were on on shows like the New Music, uh, they were just like really cool. They were doing really cool stuff that nobody else was doing, and I had no access to any of that. So it was odd that I I actually had kind of idolized a lot of those people who wanted being a writer. And I, I streamed through television, and I wanted to make documentaries and stuff. But I guess there's no time, <laughs> still time left. Um, and I just kind of landed in print because I was good at it. And I was always a, a, like a good writer. And I had some very encouraging teachers. I was like, you should do something with your writing. And I, to be honest, I didn't really, I saw what my mother did. It was a different gig every day, basically. Mm -hmm. uh, she was like a, a general assignment reporter for the Telegraph Journal in St. John. And then, well, the Gander Beacon when we lived in Newfoundland. And uh, and then the St. Croix Courier. And, things like that. and it was just like, it seemed like a cool thing. I've, sometimes my brother and I would get dragged along on assignments. And it was like, one day you're visiting an aquarium, the next day you're at a car accident. And, you know, it's just like, so it seemed like a cool way to go and not have a real job. And so I somehow managed to not have a real job for, for the past 25 years. That's what I'm saying. I'm just lazy. I like hanging out in bars and sleeping late. <laughs> what about you, Ola? Um, yeah, great question. Uh, well, I have to shout out the editors that believed in me from the start. Um, uh, Blake Mossy at the Metal Pit, you know, huge thanks to Blake. I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for him in, you know, accepting that email that day from MySpace. Uh, Sean Palmerston at Hellbound. Um, but in terms of influences of other people that I was seeing, I was really inspired by Martin Popoff. Um, quite heavily I still am today I'm, I'm actually you know super when I started working with him uh, pitching to him as a publicist it was pretty surreal for me too but I actually had the chance to meet him at a really young age I went to go uh, my dad brought me to go pick up um, the top 500 heavy metal songs of all time I was it 500 100 I, uh, I have like two of those copies um, at his, at his song office I said, album. sorry did he, did he do an albums too I think he did the a 500 albums, album yeah. Yeah. I think albums, he did both yeah. of them though, like thousands, sorry. No, 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 he, you're right, Ben, like he keeps writing and writing. Um, so excuse me if I don't have the title right at this moment, um, but I, I was able to, to meet him uh, and I read a lot of his work. I was always super inspired by what he was doing and how in depth that coverage was and how immersed he was from the start and how detail oriented uh, Martin is to this day. Uh, and as well, I love the work of Ian Christie uh, who is the founder, you know, uh, owner of Bazillion Points Books, a publishing company, and he's put out a lot of fantastic works as well. Another great writer, Lena Dawes, who I'm so thrilled to have called a colleague over the years, who wrote um, What Are You Doing Here? A uh, really fantastic um, book about uh, Black uh, women in heavy metal music scene. So Lena, like I, I've always admired her work and we we actually collaborated on covering a Metallica a show in 2007, I think it was or something. And, and it was cool. She took the photos. I, I wrote the, the review, but um, people like Lena, Martin, Ian, uh, and as well, someone that I've idolized from time, Sam Dunn uh, of Banger Films and um, Metal Headbangers Journey, Global Metal and the like. So those are people that I really looked up to in terms of the type of coverage and the style of coverage. Um, and also looking, looking back to the detail around, you know, kind of why I was originally interested in musicology and that detail oriented uh, element of it. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I, what I, I always like to ask that because I think that, you know, who those people are in terms of who you look, who you look up to, if someone's in your life that you can look up to, I think that kind of shapes the boundaries you set uh, for yourself, you know, if the people you look up to are breaking boundaries as you're still following them, um, it kind of lets you know that you shouldn't put those 
uh, boundaries on yourself. This one is probably my favorite question. And it's what did you do to kind of separate yourself? What were you at? What were you focusing on? What did you make sure you were doing differently? Um, you know, to kind of make sure that you were cemented um, in the field. There's, is there one thing that you think that you focus on that kind of made, you know, your whole way? Do you want to go, Ola? Or do you want me to go? You go ahead, Ben. You, you, you're you wiser. You have more experience than me. <laughs> I, I, I was, I, I, like, I'm not a hustler. And I, I find, like, I, you know, I gave myself this summer after I left the star to kind of be a dad because my, my, I just was easier than rather than have two people working in a two bedroom apartment with a three year old best friend. And I, I realized I got to start hustling again. Uh, cause I'm, you know, freelance now, but I, I, I realized in, in hindsight that I was kind of like more casually ambitious than I, I thought I like, I'm maybe, maybe, maybe I con myself as much as I con other people into thinking that I'm not that ambitious, but I talked my way into to things and I, and I, and I had a really good, I had Craig McKinnis, who was a former rock critic and a movie critic from the star, was my arts reporting prop in my third year at Carlton. I think he was really, he looked back, he was the really encouraging one. He introduced me to other people, um, including a number of journalists from the star, um, who also believed in me. It was cool, but I, but I sort of surrounded myself with, with um, people who could help me out. And, and when I did like an internship anywhere, I would try to do the entertainment stuff and, and, and just like, I guess that was that was kind of my way of just like making it known that I wanted to do this. Like Ola was just saying, like you just bring people, bring people up, say, hey, do you, do, you, do you mind if I do this? But I didn't have a lot of experience coming from, mm-hmm. you know, like we didn't have like a cool high school newspaper or anything mm-hmm. like that at Fundy High. We had a pretty good hockey, team, you know, like like, and, and no no arts and uh, uh, education really, like, no drama, very, not very much stuff like that. So we didn't have any of that that kind of like I envied all my friends in St. John who had like putting on plays and playing in bands. Mm. Um, so it was just like bluffing my way into a, a lot of gigs and, and also being good and, and, you know, like having the confidence to know that I could do well. I mean, that that's a big part of it too. I think is if you work at something long enough and you know you're good at it or you know you're smart enough to do it, that, I think that comes across in the way you carry yourself. But that was kind of my thing. It was like, well, you know, that summer when I interned at the Ottawa Sun, I'd known Brian Gorman, the editor there, beforehand and was like, hey, can I do some stuff for you? Is it okay if the city people let me do some stuff? And he had me cover, even though I knew, I, I just still know nothing about jazz. I had to cover the Ottawa Jazz Festival. Wow. Like producing a story a day. And he just sort of threw me into it. And I was like, I don't know anything about jazz. Shit, what have I done? Like, is that kind of, oh God, here it goes. And he's like, just react to it. And that's kind of like what the gig of being a music writer is. At the end of the day. So I pulled that off and then I went up covering, then they gave me tickets to like Eden Fest, which is like a three day thing that ended in flames and rioting and a, a fake heart attack, I believe, on the part of the promoter. I shouldn't say fake, I might get sued. I felt <laughs> suspicious that you couldn't pay anybody. But I like, covered that for for them. And then, and that's like I say, I parlayed that and just hanging around and getting to know Paul from the critic and, and the people in the entertainment section. And by the end of the summer, the day that the city department was calling to offer me my first full-time job, right at like right at the end of my student gig, wow. the phone rang as I was leaving the house uh, to preempt Linda, and it was Brian Gorman, the entertainment son, and he was like, oh, "They're going to offer you a job. Don't take it. I want you to be the music writer for three months." I was leaving, so I turned <laughs> down this job against everyone's advice. Several one guy in the sports section was like, "You're making." Crazy. But like to take this three month contract and it, and it worked out, right? And then during that time, I managed to get interviewed a couple of times by the Toronto Star, even though I, I had really no experience whatsoever. That And the second time I actually managed to talk my way into that one. So it's I think it was just putting yourself in front of people who, who, who can, you know, help you climb the ladder and give you a shot. I think that's it. It's like, like just give me a shot. Which is exactly, I think, what all of us say is like, hey, can I do this for you? And if you, the proof is in the pudding, if you can do it, people will ask you to do it again. Mm-hmm. I echo that a lot, Ben. Yeah, I, I think that's true. And that goes in every industry. You need to have one or two, even if it's just one person that really believes in you and says, hey, I'm going to give you a chance. I see you, I hear you, I'm, I'm gonna give you a chance and give you this space to do what you want to do. Um, that's really important and you have to, I feel very grateful for those people as well. But um, similar to that, I just, I went for things and this is also at a time where in the in the metal community, as someone that attended a lot of shows, uh, in comparison to now, probably one of five 
women identifying people in the venue. Um, you know, uh, and same goes for for uh, people working in media in that specific space. And I mean, I've covered all types of music and all types of beats throughout my journalism career. And same goes for being a publicist. But at that time, it was a it was a bit of a risk too. It was really really stepping into a space that was not necessarily welcome for you, right? Like it, it wasn't necessarily, cre it, it was still very much a, that boys club stigma in the metal community that, that you know, we continue to break those boundaries today. And there's still more more dismantling happening in that community today, which is, which is great to see, but there's a lot of work to be done. But stepping in front of those opportunities and just cold calling people and saying, hey, you know, I, I have this passion, this interest, this is what I can do, providing a sample of writing and then when it was for like a new publication, um, I would just provide that past portfolio again and again and just continue to reach out and connect and show people, you know, what what I'm capable of and, and what I'm interested in doing and, and why I love it. I think passion really, it, it shows in your work, right? It really shows. And when people see that uh, and when there's positive feedback from consuming that work from audiences and readers, then that, that further proves that um and and i just i continue to do that throughout my my career and and also as well this you know i i started writing at 15 when like i would go home from school from like high school like right like i would come home my mom would say oh you know you got a bunch of things from sean in the mail it'd be like stacks of like death metal and thrash promos from these obscure bands from like Austria and Sweden and like a band from Texas and then a band from Alberta and and I'd be like wow okay where do I begin and I, that's how I would spend my afternoons and then get to my schoolwork and then get to my part-time retail job or mix that all up in between so that has been my life forever because then I continue to do that throughout university I, I before I worked at McMichael during university I worked retail to pay for school. I freelanced for several publications, commuted five hours total door to door a day for four years and finished my projects for, for my undergrad. So that that is like the constant. I will say that I did I did hustle and I don't I don't um, I don't recommend this to anyone if you're trying to really like live your life at the age that you're supposed to enjoy things. Um, <laughs> and not to say that I didn't enjoy it, I loved it, but you know, also chill, enjoy your life, you know, balance, balance. Because for me, I was like, okay, sometimes it got a little bit much, but I'm grateful for it because it, it um, established a serious sense of discipline and care for the work. Um, so yeah, so that was something that, that I, I did throughout and and one thing I wanted to know too um, there was a huge opportunity when I was 17 I um, really reached out and did a cold call to an independent um, filmmaker in New York well two of them um, you know rest in peace to uh, Aaron Aitz but Audrey Ewell and Aaron Aitz the directors producers of Until the Light Takes Us uh, an award-winning independent documentary on the Norwegian black metal scene um, I reached out to them one day and said, hey, uh, I think our metal community would love this film. We need to bring it to Toronto. And at the time it was like traveling through Sundance um, and doing a bunch of uh, festivals in Europe and the States. And I said, you know, you need to bring it here. And that was kind of like my first foray into independent PR. I was the independent street team in Toronto and we brought it to the Royal in February wow. 20, 2013, I want to say. Yeah. So. No, yeah. I, I I like I like uh, both of the stuff you guys said, and, and the theme I saw a lot, um, even though you know Ben said he's not a hustler, is uh, the passion. And I, you know, we're we're obviously lucky to be in an industry where passion is kind of easy to come by, and, and you see that you see a lot. Most people don't get into journalism for the money. Um, so, you know, I think the passion definitely goes a long way. The industry has changed though, where there's a lot less full time work a lot of contract work, a lot of freelancing. For someone who's kind of coming up, um, in terms of freelance opportunities or, you know, volunteer opportunities, what do you suggest someone either take or not take in that way? Man, it, there, it's, it's, 
I mean, I was lucky. I had a, a staff, a union in staff job at the Star for 22 years. And I I know, I have a lot of friends who are editors and, and, and you know, I know what they, like, I mean, not that I was making a, a fortune, I was doing pretty good for being a music writer. Um, and, you know, if my teeth fell out, I didn't have to worry. Um, but it, it's, um, it's crazy to see how, how much less work there is outside of, like, you know, well, like there's there's half as many, probably only about a quarter as many at the newspaper I just left, right? Positions, full positions, and there were when I started. And freelance rates have gone down. There's I mean, most public, like in music journalism, so many publications have fallen off. It's just like, I think if you're just starting out, uh, you shouldn't be too picky. You can go after the gigs that you want, but that, I mean, it's it's like you want to build up a portfolio. You want to you want to get some work. So find good, you know, try to link yourself up with a rep, at least a reputable publication. Maybe not a right wing conspiracy theorist website or something, but you want to work. And I, I think in the beginning, you're going to have to take some shitty paying or even, I mean, like, don't work for free. I feel like that devalues the whole industry. And, and that's a, a, one of the problems with like the, the, sort of the age of blogs community. A lot of people are willing to give it up for free. And a lot of places, like a major metropolitan newspaper, were like, why are we paying people for all, you know, to do all this? They're working for free. Why wouldn't they work for free? But, you know, but that, that attitude brought everything down. And, and I, so it's I, like, I think when you're starting out, if you're just getting out of school or you're in school and you, you, you carry on like Ola Mazuka and you, you, you bully your way into as much work as you can get. Um, because it's only good, you know, doing good work will beget more work, you know, and, and, and but the only way to, to get a good reputation is to, to do it. And the only way to get better and to kind of master your craft really is to do it a, a lot. Like, you know, especially, if, if, you know, especially with writing, I think when you're writing, you've got to do it a lot and you have to develop your own voice. And that goes for broadcast too. You have to have a, like your own hook and, and you have to establish your own identity. And, and the way to do that is to kind of find your own identity by practicing your craft. And so I, in the beginning, you know, it's okay to fail when no one's watching and maybe you make 50 bucks or a hundred bucks or, you know, but it, it's like, I think in the beginning, just, work as much as you can and, and gain that experience and gain the confidence to go forward and gain the confidence to, to kind of push your way into, into uh, bigger and better things. But the only way to do that is to do it. So you got to start somewhere. Mm -hmm. Okay. I feel that. I feel that. Ola, you have anything to add? Yeah, I, I would say the same. I think, I mean, looking back now, it, it was a bit different because I saw it as, you know, and it's still, it was an amazing opportunity. I wouldn't have the portfolio I have today if I didn't just do the work. And, and I was quite young as well, but I worked for free for years, for years, for years and years. I worked for free. Like I just said, I, I had to work retail jobs to pay for school and I would freelance for free to build that portfolio while I was studying. So I, I, I sacrificed a lot. Um, it, it, it granted me great opportunities and a lot of growth. And like Ben said, establishing the voice, which is super important as a journalist, you know, because you're reading someone's words. And now we have multimedia, it's a bit different. But when you read something, you can you can hear that person and, and what they're sharing through that and, and get that vibe. It's, it's, a, it's a quality, right? There's something special about that. And same with you, Adriel, like you have a voice and you have a style with the cool table and the work that you produce. You've established something because you worked at it, right? That's that's a gift and it, it takes effort to craft to to really cultivate and develop that gift too or tap into it um but I, I would say yeah you know take the opportunities that you can get in the beginning but be mindful later on when it comes to survival especially now we're in a really changing state economically there, there's a lot of things happening and people need that support so be mindful do as much as you can you know with what you can in that frame but um as you go forward, yeah, definitely know where you stand in terms of respecting that, you know, compensation and and um, anything else around internship or uh, freelance opportunities. Now, those those gems are are huge um, in terms of you know working for free, the portfolio that it builds you, and that going on to becoming something paid. I brought up a story in my head. I I um, volunteered for this show and I was like an assistant PA, just really kind of helping out, a helping hand. And they asked me the following year to be the to be the lead PA, 
And, you know, I, one of my mentors just kind of mentioned to me, she should probably ask for some money. I, I hadn't even thought of that. I was just like, you know, I volunteered last year. I'm going to have a leadership role this year, but I'll just, I'll just volunteer again. It didn't even kind of clue into me to ask for money. And, you know, when, when, once I did, I got, I got paid pretty well. I think it was three days of work and I made $400 and, you know, at that time that was huge. Man, I made that a week when I was the intern at the sun. Yes, <laughs> you're doing all right. <laughs> and, 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 and that's just like Ola said, it's like, you know, having kind of the peace of mind to value your work and make sure that, you know, once you've built a portfolio that you feel is at a level, um, you know, don't be afraid to get paid. I want to talk about Corona a little bit. Um, you know, we're obviously all, all going through, we know the effect it's had on our lives. Talk about, I guess, how it made you think about the future of your of your business or or of your careers. Has it changed the way you thought about what you're going to be doing going forward? And I want to start with uh, Ben for this one because, again, you know, you're you're going through a time where you're spending more more time at home, and you know, music and writing is something you can do from home to some degree, but um, obviously it's not the same as going to shows and meeting the artists. So has it changed how you think about the future of what you do? Well, yeah, I mean, I. I... I mean, I could not have picked probably a more inopportune moment to leave a salaried position, like it's economically <laughs> speaking. Mm -hmm. um, it just, but I, 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 the way I looked at it was I had a, a summer, pro, and even then in March, I was like, oh, it's like this kid's off daycare till September. And I was like, I had the opportunity to go and, and, and take a buyout and get, and, you know, kind of get paid to be a dad this summer. And I, and I looked at it, strategically i was like well because there's not there's no touring you're right any and most of the pitches i'm you know you, you're, you're going to make just to get that hook and stuff or touring acts people with new releases mm -hmm. um a lot of people were holding off on on dropping recordings even then i think not not thinking that it would perhaps go on and and dive to the extreme depths that it has because no one's going on the road for a long time at least not for the states right mm -hmm. so i i yeah, I look at that actually. I, I right now for music journalism, I mean, it, it's it's time to be creative, and uh, and come up with ways to pitch stories and frame stories that aren't the kind of like those lazy resorts to us. Someone's coming to town, or are you you know? Mm -hmm. I mean, I love doing. One of the things I love doing is is live concert reviews, and I I'm bummed that I won't be doing that for a long time. And I I don't I'm not like a live stream or kind of guy it's not quite the same you know it's just not the same but it, I, so I, that that kind of like one of the one of the key things that i love doing i looks like i'm not going to be able to do it for a while so as i get back to work and as i'm thinking about um pitching people because my kid is finally going to go back to preschool god help us all in september <laughs> um oh, yeah. so i could be dead in a month but uh, uh it's it's just like come, trying to come up with kind of, I want to say nifty ideas, but like <laughs> thinking, like thinking about things in, in like uh, kind of a, a new framework and, and in the present context. And, and that's actually kind of cool because I think a lot of the time entertainment journals in general, uh, at least at like the kind of the mainstream daily level where you're, you know, from the star or the, the globe on down to like e-talk or those horrors, but it is very much on album cycle, touring cycle movie yeah. release cycle and it's it's kind of lazy and i think uh one of the maybe silver linings to this is is that you'll get some kind of cool creative work and i that's and that's that's why i kind of you know one of the things i always liked about um uh music magazines back in the day were the thoughtful kind of conceptual pieces and stuff and you i mean that's that's one of the sad things about like the, the decline in, in, in print music journalism it's just there's not so much of that out there but i feel like this is actually not the worst time to kind of foment a resurgence and that kind of stuff mm -hmm. but i mean like basically no but it's it's uh, i'm i'm a i mean i'm, I'm lucky I, I i put in a lot of time so i, I had that little financial parachute for the uh, um so i i have some time to I, i'm working on some some stuff that's not print oriented <laughs> basically okay. because i feel like that part like I love, I love it, and I don't want to stop writing. But I, 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 it's not the opportunities aren't there quite mm -hmm. like they used to be. And so it's a good time to kind of diversify. And I think maybe you know, uh, coming out of school, you, you guys, are, I think kids at Ryerson and, and Carlton are places today 
they're actually coached a little more along multimedia lines, whereas it was very much, I was lucky because I, I did TV and film, um, but uh, it was like, you got to pick one or the other. And now I think that skill set is, is necessary in, for 360 degrees. Mm -hmm. They follow me? Yeah. Although, well, what about you? Have this been changed the way you thought about uh, your future and how your career is going to kind of pan out? Well, primarily, like, I'm, I'm really grateful to be able to still to, to continue working because artists are still putting out music. They're still pushing forward. They're making do with the current situation. Like, we've seen a lot of innovation and, and really, like, a, a, adapting and adaptation to um, using multimedia more uh, with the artists that we work with because they've had to adapt, right? There's a lot of self-recording and production happening at home now, whether it's, like, a session and things like that. Um, so, I mean, I, I have hope, but it would be nice, like Ben said, to get back to the more of the in-person intimacy of going to shows. And in our case, like having artists do in-person sessions for TV and radio, because there's, you can't beat that human connection, right? You really can't beat it. Even this, you know, like I would so love to hang out with you guys, like, and have a coffee at CJRU in studio, you know, like, and, and uh, that, that's that's something that, that is, is missing right now that, that humans, do generally need so hopefully we can get back to that um and in terms of how everything else will flow i i don't really know how the music industry will look in the next few months it's changing by the day right we're seeing a lot of different things hap happening this year there's a lot of a lot of stuff happening um and we'll, we'll see how everyone responds to that and how we can work together to create um not a new industry, but an evolved industry and in spaces from, from what people are, are, are moving through and through the impacts of what's happening worldwide. Uh, but in terms of, yeah, in terms of journalists or, or people coming out of school now, I, I think, as, as Ben said as well, echoing that, they are a bit more well-equipped maybe than we were uh, coming out of school. And I, I graduated 2014, so I, I didn't do the um internship or mass head program actually i did i don't know if this is still an option at, at ryerson j school but i did my three capstones which are like doing three thesis projects so yeah yeah we still we have to have those yeah. you still have it instead so i did that instead because at the time i was actually the features editor of a women's print magazine so i was like i can't do mass head and produce for this magazine and you know mm. so i uh, did tv doc photojournalism and advanced feature which you know has equipped me to even do my own work and my own podcast as well like being able to use that multimedia so i think in order to be uh flexible and adaptable and stay on your toes and and understand that innovation with whatever we might face going forward just gather the tools that you can um you know if you're in school and there's a course that that might be helpful um to utilize some of those skills or to build some of those those skills with what you might need then yeah, i'd suggest that because you really don't know and now looking back i'm i'm glad i know how to use creative suite even if it's mm. you know for my creative projects it's important and, and also to help like to help artists sometimes you're like oh yeah i know how to do that you know and and that's that's a tool that's that's support right mm. yeah especially like where we're, we're talking about the music industry because that's you know some place we all have in common we're all working in but that's kind of the place that's gonna be the most changed um you know in terms of in terms of entertainment in the coronavirus you know i theaters are starting to open i've i've been to, to the theater last week but it is it's gonna be a long time before we can go to any live shows and like you said like you said ben like you said ola that live show experience is unmatched you know you can have the best live stream on the planet and it will just not be the same um this is the last one before we get out of here and i'm i want to know what's your favorite part of quarantine ben mine has been that i've started to play tennis again I haven't played tennis since I was a wee wee boy and quarantine has kind of brought that back for me. So what's been the thing that you've been doing again that you haven't done in a long time? Well, I, I am, uh, because I, I'm from, I mean, I grew up from England, but I grew up in uh, Newfoundland and New Brunswick. I'm not by nature a city person, even though I've lived in Toronto longer than I've lived anywhere. There. Um, I have been, uh, blessed with, we left at the beginning of March and went up to a friend's right when that whole thing hit. 
because I was like, we need to get out of the city. I mean, I'm also into horror movies, so it was like, this is the point in the horror movie where you get out of the yep. city because someone's going to want, and sure enough, I was like, right. So we spent a month up north, and uh, I was off. So it was just me and my little girl, Polly, who's three and a half. Um, and we would just go outside all day, rain or shine. And when I came back to the night, and I'm a hiker, like I love hiking, I like backcountry camping, I like climb mountains and stuff. Um, so I've spent the past, what, almost six months outside all day with my daughter doing stuff. We, we are at Ontario Place or we're at Sunnyside Beach. We walked, we wa do these crazy, well, she's in her stroller, so she's not walking, but we, we walked almost to Jane and Finch one day. We walk up to Eggman Flats. We, we just explore the city. And, I, and it was weird when we got back, I was like, I hope it's not, it's not gonna be, because we were in the, the country uh, in, near Shelburne, on like Dufferin Highlands remote. And I was like, am I gonna freak out when I get back in the city? And I think part of the reason we left was because they were worried I'd go crazy, stuck in an apartment. But it was just me and my little companion roaming these empty streets um, for 10 hours, or 10 hours, seven, eight hours a day sometimes. And I, that's been awesome. Like I'm in the shape of my life because I, oh, perfect. it's not un, unusual for me. Like if I'm hiking by myself, I, I, I can do 35 kilometers in a day and sometimes my kid and i cover 25 or 30 kilometers here within the city and it's just been it's been great like kind of resetting and knowing i gave myself again until like september and i was like I gotta, i'll get back to work but i'm going to enjoy this summer with my kid and that's been my favorite part of quarantine it's just we are outdoors rain or shine we'll pick a you know go train spotting or go to the lake and that's that's been good it's been like the best thing for my mental and physical health <laughs> i've ever done so that's you know it's not too bad i've made the best of it that sounds amazing. That sounds amazing. Yes, really. That sounds amazing for real. Yeah, it is actually. I, I'm not gonna lie. That's a nice way to spend your summer, Ben. I know that in the whole time too. That that's so nice. You get to cultivate a relationship with your daughter and be outside and and walking. Like I, that's yeah. One thing for me too is walking and roaming the alleys in my neighborhood. I live in the West End, so just checking out alleys that I haven't seen before. I mean, I'm always walking outside in general, whatever season, but um, I love the rail path. I love, you know, exercising on the, the rail, rail path. path. Yeah, yeah. We're on it every day, we'll look for you. Me too, yeah, I'm there every day. So I it's I, I, I love it a lot. I, I love where I live, I'm very, very blessed, uh, very grateful for that. But the other big thing I have to say is my records. My records have saved me throughout this entire, uh, just just life I guess my <laughs> records are super important to me I, I've been an, you know an avid uh, vinyl collector for, for a long time and as of uh, last year I started playing out spinning um, so uh, all, all analog sets so I've just been cultivating it and working on mixes when I can um, has been a huge blessing and uh, and even like you know looking at records and listening to them listening to the records that I haven't um, checked out in a long time I'm like oh I forgot I had that so um, yeah, really special, really present medium to to enjoy and engage in. I'm I'm happy to hear that we we got some good stuff going on uh, amidst the quarantine. You know, seeing everyone uh, being a little bit uh, more depressed, a little more gloomy, it was really affecting me early in the quarantine. But I'm just happy to hear everyone's finding something that they can enjoy. Um, thank you guys so much for dropping by. Thank you really for dropping by. You really dropped some huge gems. Um, let the people know where they can follow you and, and support what you guys are doing. Um, right now, I, I got, uh, well, you can find me on Twitter. It's pretty easy to remember. It's uh, at I hate Ben Rayner. Um, it's mostly because I hate myself. Uh, <laughs> I, I got some stuff coming out, but I can't, I can't really talk about the, the big one. Um, no worries, no worries. And I'm, I, I just got, uh, I just got, um, I think I can talk about this one. Um, I just got hired to by, uh, to work with my, my dear friend Lisa Lajusur on a, a little web series um, for a, a, a like a not for profit, which is coming out I think in September. We had we're, it's starting. So I, and a, a couple other things. I, yeah, I have stuff going on, but I can't 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 talk <laughs> can't talk about some of it. But it, it's it's I'm I'm coming back. Like I said, I gave myself the summer. Um, I actually just, I wrote my first piece since December the other day for my buddy Charles's website, Northern Charles. Wow. Uh, that was like the first um, the first thing I'd done in months and it felt good. And last night I knocked out a, 
a bio for a, a new record by Born Ruffians. And I was like, oh, I like this. Well, it's good. So I was like, I'm working again. But uh, uh, the the kind of public things, I can't I can't quite talk about. Okay, no but worries, no worries. <laughs> Uh, yeah, you can uh, connect with Indoor Recess at indoorrecess.com. Uh, you can find me on Instagram if you like at O L A M A Z Z. Uh, same with Ben, Twitter. I just said the other day, I, I barely tweet, but if you want to link with me there, it's Ola, O L A underscore M A Z Z, Ola Maz. Uh, and follow Indoor Recess on Instagram as well. It's Indoor Recess Inc. Uh, incorporated yeah so c to connect with our artists and all the great things that we do thank you guys so much for dropping by this has been dropping gems until next time know yourself know your worth Young